Welcome to After Image. I'm your host, David Kurlander. I'm the editorial producer of the Cafe and Vox Media Podcast Network history show, Now and Then. And I'm also, as it may not be a surprise to too many people, a bit of an archives nerd. I love digging around online in old John Quincy Adams you know, digital letters or uh, watching you know, scratchy old clips from congressional floor debates on C-SPAN. And I have a vision of a way that we can use those archives to honor people who have recently passed on. And there have been a lot of them lately. We're losing the folks who helped to create and make sense of the second half of the 20th century. On After Image, I want to find one piece of archival media that can help to rethink, to make sense of, to reinterpret the life of someone who's recently died. And then... I'm going to bring in someone to interview who was there at the conception of this artifact, whether they shot a piece of film, were the interviewer, made something that someone who just died was in. And for this first week of After Image, we're going to focus on the amazing actress Louise Fletcher, who recently died. Uh, Louise Fletcher is best known for her role as Nurse Ratched in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which won her the 1976 Academy Award for Best Actress. Now, three years after One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Fletcher appeared in a little-known film called Natural Enemies, and she played a depressed housewife named Miriam Stewart. It's a really fantastic movie, and it's an electric performance from Fletcher. And we are lucky enough to have the director of this 1979 film, Natural Enemies, in the studio with us today. His name is Jeff Canoe, and he's going to tell us a little bit about what it was like to work with Louise Fletcher and what this performance says about her talent. So I'm honored to be joined today uh, by the director, editor, screenwriter, Jeff Canoe. Uh, he's been involved in a staggeringly diverse slate of films, from editing the heartbreaking Ordinary People to directing the classic college comedy Revenge of the Nerds. And Jeff directed Louise Fletcher, who we recently lost in his 1979 movie Natural Enemies. And Fletcher played Miriam Stewart, the depressed wife of the also very depressed Paul Stewart, who was a 48-year-old magazine editor played by Hal Holbrook. Uh, the film has flashbacks, but it largely takes place over the course of a single day as Holbrook's Paul moles whether to kill Fletcher's Miriam, his children, and himself. So this is pretty heavy stuff um, with performances that I found truly riveting. Um, now that you're describing it, I think we're going to change the title to yeah. Beyond Depressed. Beyond Depressed. The bleakness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but <laughs> Jeff, you wrote the, the screenplay. Uh, to National I Enemies adapted as well. the screenplay right adapted very faithfully it. from the novel too faithfully in some instances I, I may have mentioned to you that I, at one point in the middle of the book Louise's character realizes she finds this loaded gun in the closet and realizes that her husband is contemplating something which she assumes is suicide right doesn't really realize that he's got a, a plan to wipe out the whole family but she calls him at work to try and kind of talk him down off the ledge. This morning, I was cleaning your room and I found the rifle in the closet. It was loaded, Paul. And this phone call is quite lengthy in the book and I thought it was very good so I decided to leave it long in the movie. So when I ended up editing the movie, there was a 14 minute phone call in the middle of the movie. <laughs> and I realized that's not okay. So I had to chop it way, way, way down. So I was, I was trying to stay faithful to the book because I really liked the writing. So this is a 1975 book by Julius Horwitz. And how did it come into your orbit? And what did you think when you read it? It came at a time I, I, I had come from getting kicked out of college, uh, failing in the world of rock and roll, and then I became a, uh, an assistant to a movie advertising executive who was making trailers. And from that, I kind of segued into learning how to make trailers and starting to have a, a trailer making company. Uh, and I luckily 
after a few dry periods, got successful. So I had this successful trailer making company, and I was working on. I did The Graduate. I did Midnight Cowboy, Lion in Winter. I did uh, Woody Allen movies, Mel Brooks movies, Rocky, Cuckoo's Nest, and I was making really nice money. I worked very hard because. I had like eight editors working for me, but I used to have to supervise. And the rest of the time I had to do what you'd call client relations, which means kissing clients' asses and spending as much time with them as possible so Generous. that one of my competitors wouldn't get in there. Right. So that was my life. And I was getting kind of burnt out. And I thought I, I, I had this neurotic need to be somebody. Mm -hmm. And when Cuckoo's Nest won all these Oscars, including – uh, Louise Fletcher's, I was at the the after party and someone walked up to me and said, what did you do on the movie? And I said, well, I made the trailer. And they went, <laughs> what do you mean you made the trailer? The projectionist shows scenes from the upcoming films. You don't make a trailer. And I realized, okay, so that's how little credit I'm getting for what I do. And I, I thought at that moment, okay, I, I have to make a movie. I had made a couple of movies that we won't talk about a little porno, a little less porno, and a documentary called Black Rodeo. Um, but I, I wanted to make my own film and get the credit. So I started looking around for a project, and right at about this time, I saw Ingmar Bergman's film, Scenes from a Marriage, and I fell in love with that because it was depressing and bleak, and that's, I guess, who I was also at the time. And so I got the rights because no one else was dumb enough to option that. And I adapted it. Uh, and I mean, was that your question? You adapted, you were, I didn't write the movie, I adapted it right, from the book. From okay, and so that was my motivation, which is not to be the guy, the, the guy who everybody thinks the projectionist does his job for him. And I still was at the peak of my career making trailers, so I was working on All the President's Men and Billy Jack and Walking Tall and Ben the Rat and all this stuff but I was trying to get this movie on its feet. And finally, uh, with the help of a, of a producer named Elliot Kastner, who I had done trailers for, he convinced me that I, the, the thing I have to do is just start making it, and then the financing will come. So I took money out of my trailer company with the same money I had used to option the book, and I started making the movie. I hired a production manager and the process was moving forward, and I didn't have the money to make a, a real movie. I had the money to make a low-budget, non-union movie. And I wasn't going to be able to get stars, but I felt that this was such an actor's piece that I really had to try and get good, solid actors. And again, this is like a long, rambling story, but I got Hal Holbrook after a crazy sort of odyssey of actors and Hal Holbrook accepting it and then, then meeting me and then quitting. <laughs> and then I got him back because Robert Redford helped me get him back. And anyway, so I had um, Hal Holbrook and I had the script and I had hired a production manager and I was full force getting ready to make this movie in a couple of months, hoping the money was going to come in from investors, which it never did. And the actress that I had in mind initially, because I wasn't looking at stars, uh, I could, you know, afford to pay Hal something, but the the female lead, I didn't have enough money to really get a, a big person. There was an actress named Michael Learned, who was the mother on the Waltons. That's what most people know her from. And she, was, and she did a thing called Nurse, a television show. And I thought she was really good, solid actor, felt like she could be married to Hal Holbrook, and I wasn't overreaching. So I sent her the script, and she said yes. Uh, this leads us to an incident where I went to L.A. to rehearse with my now leading man and leading lady, and I had never really made a movie. I'd made just a documentary and a couple of you know pieces of silly stuff, and I had never really worked seriously with actors, real actors, and I had never taken acting class, so I kind of was didn't know the language. So I got into the room, and they started to do a, a read-through, and they weren't really giving it much, but I didn't know whether I should say, come on, guys, you know, a little more energy. I thought maybe that's just what they do when the first time they meet each other and the first time they read, they just kind of, which is true, a cold read, they don't put much into it. 
but I didn't really understand that. So about halfway through, I realized this is the worst piece of shit anyone ever wrote, and it's terrible, and I'm, what am I gonna do? And I said, can we like take a break? And we went downstairs to the coffee shop and we we're sitting there and having a little chit chat. And suddenly, just like in, in an old 40s black and white movie, I hear my voice, my name being spoken, and it sounds like it's echoing. And I feel like there's faces circling around me. And I realize, I think I've just blacked out. <laughs> but I'm sitting up and Hal Holbrook and Michael Leonard are going, Jeff, Jeff, are you okay? And I had I just, just gone inside my head realizing that this is never going to go anywhere. And I say to them, you know what? I'm really sorry. I owe you both an apology. This is a terrible, terrible script. And I, I'm sorry I got you involved in this. And they said, it's just a cold read. You know, what are you worried about? But she quit the next day. Michael learned. Because I... Actors, actors want the director to seem confident, right. <laughs> Not, you know. Uh, so now I don't have a leading lady. Hal Holbrook's still on. He says, we'll get somebody. And we're now like a month away from shooting. And a friend of mine through the my movie advertising life was a, a publicist who worked at United Artists. And I told him one day what was happening. I lost my leading lady. And he goes, well, what about Louise Fletcher? I said, come on, I'm not gonna get Louise Fletcher. She just won the Academy Award earlier this year. What are you, crazy? He said, well, I just happen to know that she's down in Missouri at her parents, they were friends, at her parents' farm and she's not doing anything. And she's a little annoyed that all the roles she gets, all gets offered are like villainous women like Nurse Ratched. And this was a sympathetic role. So I said, hey, will you send her the script? He said, yeah, give it to me. He sent her the script. And I guess between working with Hal Holbrook, who's a fine actor, and a, playing this sympathetic character in an intelligent movie, she said yes. I didn't have much money for her, but there she was. And I, and I got Louise Fletcher. I got the Academy Award-winning actress into my first movie, basically. Was she enthusiastic about the script and the story and the character from the beginning? Or what were those first interactions and in kind of building her character like? I pretty much didn't know enough to have those kind of conversations with my actors. I figured, you know, they've read the script, they want to do it, they must understand, and it's pretty clear how these characters are. I mean, it's a couple that's lost their communication and they're sort of immune to each other at this point. And she had had, a, her character had a nervous breakdown and tried to commit suicide. And so she's got all that to work with I don't, I didn't feel like I had to tell her anything. And Hal just has to be, you know, very alienated and, and he narrates the whole movie. So I, I didn't really have meetings where we discussed the characters. I figured, you know, they read the script. It came from the book. Someone has done a lot of thinking about these characters, particularly the novelist. And I didn't know enough to go through that process with them. So I can't say, I can't take credit for anything Louise did other than, I was there on set with her, and had it not felt right, I would have said something. But it always felt right, what she was doing. And I think she really understood this situation. Um, so we, didn't, we had a very cordial relationship, and everything went smoothly. Do you think there's a scene in the film where she shines the most, or that you find yourself going back to the most? The scene when... Uh, he comes home and they're sitting in the, in the kitchen discussing, he's discussing why he feels the way he does. He goes, I don't know my own children. I hate myself. And, but she triggers his speech by saying, I know, what, I know that there's something inside you and why don't you just get it out, you know? And it's, it's a really intense across the small table dialogue scene. Am I wrong? Just answer me, yes or no? I can't answer for a lifetime. For a lifetime. What's that supposed to mean? You make our life sound like something out of a bad novel. You make our marriage sound like something that has to be resurrected. People who live together as long as we have shouldn't have to resurrect anything. We're not museum pieces. 
What's done is done. There's no way of going back. Well, I think there is. Just talk to me. That scene at the table is is a real critical scene. I mean, that, that scene was the one moment that when I made the trailer for the movie, that was the star of the trailer, her speech there. And then she has a long, great scene, which is the end of the movie, where she basically tries to talk him down off his ledge. So we're shooting what's really the finale of the film, and the finale is Miriam, his char- her character, is going to try and it's kind of like make her defense summation of her life and the life of her kids. She doesn't really know that it's her kids, but she's trying to reach him in in this dark place where he is. And so they're in the woods, middle of the night, walking and talking, and she's tr- very, very gently trying to remind him that he has a lot to live for. And he's listening, but he's actually still too far gone, and uh, it's it's a big, long dialogue, walk and talk scene. And finally, at the end, she gets to him and he gets emotional and sits down and his head's down. And then after she finishes her speech, they get up and walk back into the house. That's the end of the book. So we don't really know, but we assume maybe everything's going to be okay. And that's how the book ended. And I was happy for the movie to end that way as well. But I noticed that in the novel, if you close, there's like a half page blank as the last page of the book. If you just flip that over, there's a a news clipping uh, uh, that says, man kills family self. And you realize, oh oh my God, he did it anyway. I called the author and I said, why do you, you have two endings? He said, yeah, I wrote the hopeful ending And a lot of my friends that read the book said I copped out. So I added that little thing. For those who choose to flip that page, they see that I didn't cop out. And I thought, well, when I have the script together, I'm not going to put it like that. I'm going to let them walk back into the house. And so that's the script that everyone committed to. And about a week before shooting, Hal calls me and he says, they have to die. I said, yeah, but I really left it this way. And I told him the story about the book and everything. I said, because I want to at least have the choice for it not to be so bleak at the very end. I mean, we put the audience through two hours of bleakness, leave them with a little hope. I mean, aren't we kind of talking about the need for communication? They got to die. I go, I'll tell you what, we're going to have a choice. Once the film is together, either we will let them walk into the house or I'll have a news bulletin come on and say as tragedy struck in West Reading, Connecticut tonight, yada, yada. He agreed to that. But the night of the shoot, which was after four weeks of shooting, it was our, our next to last week, we're in the woods and we do the first rehearsal and he doesn't sit down and break down. So I thought, okay, he's saving it for the take. Another dolly shot, Louise does her speech, it's great. We think she must be reaching him. He, in the first take, he won't sit down. So I say, cut. Hal, we, you know, I need you to like go through all the way to where you sit down and, and at the end. And he goes, I'm not doing it. I said, but we kind of discussed this. You know, I, I need that so that I have the, op- the option of two either or endings. He says, no, it's me up there on the screen. And if I don't believe it, I'm not going to shoot it. And he walks off into the woods. Okay, so that leaves Louise standing there after having basically acted her heart out and to no avail. My uh, line producer, production manager, and first AD was all one man named John Quill. He was kind of a bear of a guy, and he really got me through this production. He follows Hal, finds him, grabs him by the shoulders, walks him back to his mark, puts him on his mark and goes, stay. And he was a scary guy, so Hal stays, and now... I had just the two shot is all I had shot of the walking and talking and I needed close-ups. So I figured, and I I kind of sense we're losing our darkness. It's getting close to dawn and then we wouldn't be able to shoot anymore. 
So I do one take of Hal. Hopefully he'll, in his close-up, he'll at least react, but he's mostly just so angry at being dragged to his mark that his eyes get red and, and he looks very emotional, but it's the wrong emotion. And then I turn around and I do literally one take of the Academy Award-winning Best Actress doing her most important speech in the movie, and the birds are chirping, and the sun comes up, and I'm done. Luckily, she was great, but I had one take of the most important scene in the movie. Do you know when I decided that I really wanted to live? Alex and Tony fighting over a comic book. I was in my usual stupor, and I heard their voices. And at that moment, I knew that I needed them. They needed me. The fact that she did that scene in one take yeah. is pretty staggering. Yeah, you know, as a as an actress, just to because it's a it's a long scene. It's a demanding scene. Yes. Yes, and you're getting nothing from the other actor other than this this angry silence. It was amazing, and people see the movie and they have really have no idea that it, that it was that, you know. I don't want to say unprofessional, but it was done all in one silly take. Do you feel like, in terms of the arc of her character, it feels like, you know, Hal's character. It's relatively static, especially now with the story that you just gave me, that he wanted to keep that sort of stubbornness intact yes. to the end. She seems to change a lot more, um, or at least is revealed a lot more to the audience. How did you think about her arc and how to present Miriam in the film overall? Well, because there's a lot of flashbacks in the story, so in the present day story, she's actually okay. In the flashbacks, She's had a nervous breakdown. She tried to kill herself. Uh, she was in a very bad place. But her husband doesn't realize that she's recovered. And we don't really see it because of the way that the story is told until that scene in the house when she says, for Christ's sakes, you know, get it out. And then, she, and then for the this back last 20 minutes of the film, we realize she's gotten healthy somehow. And she has a much better perspective on their life and their marriage and their children. And so it was kind of structured that way in the novel and in the screenplay. So it made sense to me, you know, that she survived. He didn't. Tragedy struck last night in the town of West Reading, Connecticut, as a 48-year-old man apparently killed his wife, three children, and himself. The bodies of Paul Stewart and his family were found shot to death in their home. Police are still puzzled as to the motive. You know, this has some heavy themes about male frustration and that then being acted out as violence against other people and particularly against women. Um, I'm curious sort of with the way the world has gone over the last 40 odd years and shootings, you know, reckonings over this type of behavior all around us. You know, do you think the late 70s was an origin moment for this moment in that way? Or, you know, what what do you see as kind of the historical arc of some of these themes as they're presented in your movie? Uh, I know, that's uh, a heavy... It, you should have given me that one so I'd have some time to think Sorry. about it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, the 70s? The 70s was, you know, it was the Beatles. It, was, it wasn't such a bleak time. You know, it, it was it was very, you know, f f what was it, uh, peace pot, you know. I, I mean, there was a lot of different colors in the 70s. Uh, so, and the 80s was, was an even sillier time. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't think that was, and, and maybe like in Sweden, that kind of depression felt, organic to Sweden. But in America, I could see why people rejected it. Like, what is this? You know, you know, we're, we, we watched Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best. And what is this? This isn't right. But underneath it, I think maybe there was a, a, a sort of a, a, a bubbling up of people realizing they haven't been honest about their lives or something. I don't know. I mean, 
you know, when Hal has a, he has a scene in the movie with with Jose Ferrer, and he just he they're in a restaurant, and he just talks about his feelings about you know his, his about family and and it's all and too much TV and, and you know people are alienated from each other. Uh, that's his position, and there's nobody really other than Louise giving him an alternative. And he can't hear it. But in terms of the worldview, yeah, I mean, there's got to be a reason why no one else wanted to make that movie, <laughs> you know. So I don't think it, people didn't want to discuss this then. Maybe now you're freer to, you know, to be, to, to recognize that there is, you know, that it's hard. You know, it's hard to be happy. It's hard to be in a, in a long-term loving relationship, having children is, is, is you know, it's, it's not like Spot and Sally and Puff and Dick and Jane. It's a lot harder. Everything's a lot harder. And, may, and maybe there is now people have come to, and plus with, with all the news analyses of life and, you know, so maybe it's, people are more open to verbalizing that kind of stuff. So they're open to seeing it in a film. I was kind of over my head making that movie. I mean, it was my it was my money. It was it was my first experience. I had this crew that uh, you know all they knew their jobs better than I knew mine. Uh, so I was in a kind of a very uh, not sociable place making that movie. Uh, so we didn't hang out, right? You know, and Hal and Louise, I don't think hung out either because he was keeping himself isolated. So. No, we. I mean, we were, had a very nice cordial relationship, and she, she, you know, was nice enough not to quit. So, that was our relationship. <laughs> Makes total sense. Um, before we go, I do want to let people know where they can watch Natural Enemies and pay tribute to the incredible Louise Fletcher and to Jeff's movie making. Uh, Natural Enemies out on a new Blu-ray that is put together by the very talented uh, boutique film label Fun City Editions. Uh, the disc contains a fascinating interview with Jeff, a lot of other special features, and a truly beautiful, vivid 2K restoration from the original 35 millimeter. And you can head to funcityeditions.com to check it all out. So Jeff, thank you so much for talking with me. I, it's, is... it's funny that this movie is being released by some place called Fun City. Fun City. <laughs> yeah, it's I like know. Fun City, open a vein. Fun City.